Hey, Matt. <laughs> hey, man. Is, is everything all right? Like you don't know? No, I, I really don't. Did something happen? You're going to act like you didn't insult my cat, Marvin Snugglesworth? <laughs> what? When? At Chris's house party. I, I've never been to Chris's house. I, I've never even met you in person. Uh, what are you talking about? Ah, here he is. He can tell you. Chris, tell Dylan that you remember him insulting Marvin Snugglesworth. Who's Marvin Snugglesworth? My cat. I don't remember anything like that. This is between y'all. I can't believe this. Okay. We were all three at Chris's party. I was holding Marvin Snugglesworth. Dylan said, your cat looks like a French poodle. Then the horse in the unitard started laughing, which seemed to upset the ladybug that he was on a date with. And then... Wait, wait, wait. A horse? Are you sure this wasn't a dream, Matt? Of course not. It, wait, wait a minute. I think you actually might be right. You know, it was weird because I don't actually own a cat. Yeah, that's the weird part. Sorry, man. Uh, this could have happened to anyone, you know. <sighs> so, frame wreck? What a story, Mark. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Framewreck, the show about so bad they're good movies. Uh, I'm here with Matt, my co-host, and a special guest, uh, Chris Scott, who you may have seen on our Star Wars draft day last month. He's back to talk about uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Uh, we picked this movie. Matt, Matt, why did we pick this movie? Okay, what was the special occasion? The special, it is Pride Month, and we wanted to pick a movie that would celebrate Pride Month. Um, and, you know, we, we thought about what are some good LGBT uh, plus movies that are so bad they're good. But when we when it came down to it, we didn't want to laugh at the wrong thing or or really uh, highlight, you know, though that, you know, that kind of uh, that kind of movie this month. Uh, so we went with A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Freddy's Revenge um, because it has become a gay icon uh, mm -hmm. due to the subtext, if you want to call it subtext. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this month we, I, you know, Chris is one of my best friends. He, um, he is not only a bad movie expert, he is a horror expert, an 80s slasher expert and a queer cinema expert. So we thought, Hey, this would be a great time to have Chris on. Yeah. So kind to call me an expert <laughs> in all those fields. Well, you are. You're. You're. Uh, you're. You're really my go-to in all of those things. So. Uh, so yeah, had to had to have you on. Um, but yeah, so so we're going to talk a lot about this. I'm going to be honest with you guys, and it's going to become evident once we start talking about it. I legitimately like this movie. This is not a so bad it's good movie for me. This is actually a good movie to me. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I've seen people like put together their list and rankings, and I have never like. Uh, done a deep dive into the sequels for all these big three friday 13th halloween nightmare on elm street so this was like my first time watching this and like looking at people's rankings this always seems to fall pretty low but i'm, I'm kind of with you matt i i kind of i kind of dig this movie unironically yeah um, and I, I can't wait to hear what chris you have to say about it because i'm sure you guys have had this film in your lives a lot longer than i have i've been watching this film uh, a few more times than i have in my life so uh I, i'm really excited to talk about it yeah, um, as far as the second one goes, I mean, to rank it so low seems kind of wild when, like, the fourth one is right there. The fifth yes. one. <laughs> okay, but, yes. Um, I, I agree. The fourth one is the worst. Because uh, this, and I, yes. I, I'll talk about it later, but this one often appears at the bottom of most people's lists in terms of, of, of the ranking of these things. The fourth one is, and the fifth one is bad. The fifth one is the most ridiculous one, but the fourth one is is like fails on every level it's so, right. such a bad movie um it, for me nightmare on the street 2 comes is the fourth best of the of the nightmare movies uh it goes for me it goes three uh the dream warriors that is that is number one it, so it's the third one dream warriors is number one um new nightmare is number two uh nightmare on elm street is actually number three and then this movie this is number mm -hmm. four yeah um that's a fair ranking yeah. Honest, like. uh, so yeah, I I I I really actually like this movie. However, 
there are things to talk about uh, when it comes to this show. Yeah. So it's not it's not a it's not a perfect film, and we definitely have some things we can talk about here. Um, cool. Yeah, well, take us away, Matt. Let's dive okay. Into it. So first thing we're going to talk about, is, as always, is uh, who made it, and that is that was it was directed by Jack Shoulder and written by David Chaskin, which we will talk about later. Um, uh, how did it come to be after the success of Nightmare on Elm Street? New Line immediately greenlit this sequel. Uh, originally, they were going to make it a, a pregnancy movie, a possession mm. movie, uh, and a pregnancy. But then um, David David uh, Chaskin had hit, came up with this idea, and they decided to go with that one instead. They did end up using um, a lot of the themes that they were going to use in uh, in the second movie with the pregnancy in the. Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Dream Child, which is just a bad movie. But um, uh, so I don't know what this would have looked like if they had, you know, it was if it was before they got terrible. Next, what we need to talk about is what makes this movie great. Chris, what do you love about this movie? What do I love about it? Um, honestly, and this is a something that will sell me on most horror or genre movies. If there's a level of camp to it, I mm. will gravitate towards it. And this movie has that just all over the place. Um, unexplained set pieces are really nice in a bad movie. That's also in this movie a lot. Like, <laughs> let's, I mean, just talk about the BDSM club that just comes out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> And it, honestly, it was, I, that was strictly to establish the coach as actually gay. Like that right. was the only that was the only thing, and, and give him a reason to be in the shower with him. I guess. Yeah, and that was the only <laughs> payoff for that. Like I, I don't understand it. Um, and also, just going, you know, over more of what I really like. I like Mark Patton in this. Like he's uh, he's a good lead, in my opinion. So normally, when we talk about what makes this movie great, we're we're talking about what makes this movie so bad it's good. Um, so I will start with, and th this isn't necessarily the worst thing, um, but I'll start with how um, Jesse's parents, um, number one, I'm fairly positive that Jesse's dad is is what they based um, uh, Mike and and Nancy's dad in Stranger Things on. Oh, yeah, I can kind of see that. Because he is, he is sure. almost exactly the same. Uh, with the, with the, with the nonplussed reactions to everything, including his son screaming bloody murder from upstairs. <laughs> uh, that that scene, there's a blood curdling scream at the beginning and they all stop and look and the mom looks annoyed and the dad just goes back to reading his paper. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and Jesse's sister says, says what's wrong? Or it says something like what's wrong with, uh, with Jesse. And, and uh, the mom's like, ah, just a bad dream. There's no way you know that for sure. You're yeah, like that's, that's that was a that was a blood like it sounded like someone was being murdered and they're all just like eh, it's fine. No, the dad yeah. is amazing. There's also that scene where the toaster like goes up in flames or something or shoots flames out of it. Yeah, and then after that he inspects it, he goes, "Huh, it wasn't even plugged in." End of scene. Like End of scene. <laughs> he doesn't care that it wasn't plugged in. Like how it happened, he just goes about his day. Yeah, nice. I, I feel like the supporting characters were kind of like secondary thoughts to to Jesse and Freddy Krueger. Like this really just, it seemed like they wanted to make a movie about Jesse and Freddy Krueger. And they're like, well, we got to give him a family. We got to give him something. Uh, like, let's set him in, in the old house from the first one. I mean, that's a, that's a horror trope we see a lot of. Like, oh, we're in the same location that the first movie was years ago. And um, I, I just love the moment. My, my favorite moment with the dad is, is when they're just talking about the house and like he he just admits that he knew that this house was not haunted but that there was some crazy shit going on he was like well why do you think we got it so cheap and like she wouldn't have thought that, like if, if i get a, a really nice bargain on a house that my first thought is not gonna be oh i wonder if it's because this place had like really bad murders or some shit like that like like he asked he said it as if it was such like a, a given like well why do you think we got it for so cheap but, like well there are probably a lot of other reasons she could have probably guessed um besides that but um yeah, no, the, fa the family is a very interesting dynamic uh, just all, all around. Yeah. Um, I would like to correct you there. You did call him Freddy Krueger, which they do not, do not once call him in this movie. They call that's him right. Fred Krueger every single time. Fred, that's right. My every idea. single time they <laughs> call him weird. Fred Krueger. But it's too. Freddy's Revenge. I know. It's also, <laughs> also it's only Freddy in the title. <laughs> who's he doing Revenge on? 
I don't know. No one. Here, here's the thing about Freddy in this movie is that um, his powers are a bit confusing because he, he <laughs> seems more powerful in this film than in any film. Because mm. in every other film, he ha- you have to be dreaming for him to do right. anything. This one, he just affects the real world. He, he affects the real world from inside like just Jesse. whenever he wants. Just yeah. whenever he wants. He locks every door mm. in every Does house. not need to sleep. No one, he doesn't need to be summoned through sleep. I don't even no. think he kills anyone in their sleep at all. He does not in this movie. Although, yeah. here's the thing about, is that it gets confusing a lot, especially toward the beginning, when you're like, are they dreaming? Did he just kill someone in Jesse's dream, but someone who was not in the dream, who was not sleeping. See, I thought and it gets coach, confusing. Yeah, I thought he killed the coach. That was a dream sequence, but it wasn't because Jesse had to be returned home by the police. Yeah. So clearly he was at the gym <laughs> and killed it. Yeah. yeah. And then I love that, that, that they were like, he was, he was wandering down the road naked. It was like, okay, so this is a side of Jesse. We don't see ever in this movie at all. Is this weird? Like I've murdered someone. Now I've gone catatonic and I'm just, yeah, just ambling down the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will say when we talk about like, so good, bad, it's good movies. We all agree. Like we all enjoy this movie, but I think the yeah. one bad aspect would be the fact that the first one I think was so strong because the the sleep was this inevitability and it almost mm-hmm. added that extra layer of horror because there was nothing you could do to avoid it you you had to sleep at, at some point and to now remove that element where he can come out of nowhere with or without the sleep i mean i, yeah. I love that added sleep element and i have not seen the sequels after this i'm gonna keep going now that i've seen the second one um and i i hope they revisit that idea the whole sleep idea because i think that's what makes the first one so special and so unique uh is is this the the setting that it takes place in so yeah like that was the one thing i was a little bummed about i was like oh but but it's it's supposed the whole thing is about sleep and then, right and you know, and, you know it makes because because she kind of killed him in his in in the sleep realm mm-hmm. in the first movie or at least just defeated him i the idea okay so my and this is the thing that i always think is happening in the movie and then when i watch the movie i go oh wait that's not actually ever explicitly stated i'm always thinking he's trying to come back um, mm. it, it, like regain his power in the sleeping world. Um, but then as I'm watching the movie, that's never stated. It kind of just seems like he's he's trying to come into the real world where you would think would be worse because you you know it's you don't control the real world. Of yes, course, he kind of does. I was <laughs> like, going to bring that up because, like in the first movie, we know that Nancy she figures out, oh, I can bring things out of my dream. You know, yeah. she figures that out with the hat and she grabs that. So her plan is to bring him out of the dream and then just home alone him to death, which Mm -hmm. is what she does (laughs) successfully. And in that third act in the first movie, Freddy Krueger, he's upset that he's like trying to chase her around this house in the real world because he doesn't have (laughs) any powers. This one, he's caught consistently like, I got to get to the real world because I'm so (laughs) overpowered. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very strange and, and interesting. But, you know, he is very powerful, apparently, in the real world, at least when he's inside Jesse. When he's outside of Jesse, it doesn't seem like he has... Well, I mean, I guess he did boil a full a la- a pool full of people alive, but I guess... Yeah. Oh, my God. That party. Jesus. Yeah. That party. <laughs> yeah. I was say, that, um, that reminded me of Halloween, too, the, the hot tub scene. Like, uh, yeah. just, the, um, that, uh, that, that just gives me the EBGBs, the, the boiling water and all that, yeah. Uh, so Fred uh, is trying to get revenge on who? No, we don't know. Um, I guess they're homeowners of Elm Street. Like he just, I guess, like for some reason, if if there, I wish there had been some indication that he was trying to get to Nancy. Is her name Nancy from the? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I I had said Nancy earlier as because she's on Stranger Things, and then I'm like, mm. oh wait, am I saying the wrong name? Um, yeah. So homage. if if they had if they had mentioned Nancy at all, and like, I mean, they mentioned her in the in the book but like if they had mentioned like if he had mentioned that he wants to get to her and and get his revenge or or if maybe even she had been in it that would have been awesome Uh, but uh but yeah the fact that the fact that no one associated with this has ever had any association with freddie makes the title very strange the 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 relationship between jesse and grady I don't is, understand it. I don't understand because half friends? the time, half are the time, they... it seems like that's his best friend, but then yeah. the other half, it's like they are, they are, they are mortal enemies, and that that like they they don't want to have anything to do with each other. I don't understand. Scene to scene, they have a different relationship.
what, what's your take on that, Chris? Or, 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 where do you stand with their relationship? Uh, I kind of going more with the subtext. <laughs> it seems like there might be a little bit of a romance or a romantic feelings that Jesse has towards Grady, but of course, mm-hmm. uh, is resistant to it or just possibly even repulsed by it because honestly i i can't see them as like being friends or enemies it's weird like (laughs) what's the relationship there it kind of seems like when you when you consider it under the subtext it kind of feels like that uh jock guy who who may be closeted but like will uh call you the f slur as soon as you're done having sex with him yeah like it seems like that kind of relationship um uh but then also, like, Grady is, you know, I get the friend that he runs to when he needs help. Like, he runs exactly. from the party to him. <laughs> and, and just feels like it just assumes that he's going to help, like, he's going to be yeah. down to wake him up. It's like, I don't know if, I don't know if Jesse saw the rest of this movie, but that doesn't <laughs> feel like the, <laughs> what, what makes sense. Let's, we could talk about the subtext, because I'd like to talk about that. Before yeah. we do, I just really quickly want to mention... Uh, that the baby face dogs at the end, yes. Um, oh my god, why are simultaneously <laughs> are simultaneously terrifying and hilariously terrible? They are yes. they at the, they are at the same time just I I I don't ever want to see them again. But also like wow, that's really bad. Um, yeah, I'm not sure technology exists that would ever make them work, including today. I don't know that I don't know that they would ever be they would could never be as scary as they were if even if they were like CGI today and and everything you know and we had all the technology at our fingertips they would not be nearly as scary nor believable I mean they would be about as believable uh, but yeah I don't think the technology exists to make those work so I think that's the best they could probably do but they are scary and terrible <laughs> well I also had I had questions about that while I was watching it at some point, like, you know, they show up at the factory, and I'm just like, wait, does Freddy Krueger have anything to do with dog demons at all? Why are <laughs> these here? I don't, I don't know. I, I will say, before we get into the subtext, though, like, like kind of what Chris mentioned earlier, like, the camp of this, though, is what's fun, and like, yeah. yes, it's t- terrifying, but I think that adds to the camp, like, all these different sequences, I, I just, I'm so glad it took place when it did, when they were still doing practical effects, because mm-hmm. I feel like if you were to do any of this with CGI, it would be just a legitimately bad movie, because I think the charm of this is the practicality of everything and how over the top and silly it is. It almost feels almost Raimi-esque in mm-hmm. some places, especially with like, which we'll get to later when we talk about the subtext, but the the, the bursting, the head bursting from the stomach and, and all, just all those little moments, the brains, like... I'm the brain. Let's get into the subtext now because I think, you know, a lot of the the draw of doing it this month was talking about those extra little layers that have almost been added since the film has come out and and as more people have discovered it and embraced it in their communities. Uh, Chris... Tell us because because you are uh, you're, you're more to in tune with the, with that community. Uh, so tell us what basically how this has become such an iconic gay film. Um, well, I think it kind of goes along with the fact that I mean, I feel as if the gay community gravitates towards horror anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's that kind of safety of being scared of something, you know, on film rather than scared of reality, you know, in real life, those things, you can kind of just slip into something that's an easy fear to just take in. Uh, But this movie specifically, we look at it, we have a male protagonist who isn't necessarily the, I guess, the strongest of men he doesn't get off that you know impression he's actually Mm. most of it a victim he's the Mm. final girl basically we have this male character who's not like going up against freddy like you know to fight him or anything like that he's just being victimized by him the entire movie um and victimized in a way of freddy basically being inside of him like as a feeling also could be you know a metaphor for him being gay or part of the LGBTQ spectrum. You son of a bitch! You kill him! 
or at least that's how I think we kind of see it now. Mm-hmm. We right. look at it. He has the lines of he's inside me and he wants yeah. to use me or something Fred, like that. Yeah, Fred's inside. Yeah. Const- yeah, constantly, you know, makes that statement. And he has the girlfriend who in their orbit, all of their friends are wanting them to hook up for some reason. Like they're so invested in like Jesse and Lisa having sex. Right. Don't know why they're just all invested. And it never happens. It seems like he has kind of some anxiety when he is at her party in the little pool house or whatever and you know, make it out. And then Freddie comes through and like affects his tongue, like gives him that weird tongue thing. And then he runs off. Yeah. That's when he runs to his best friend slash enemy. I don't know, yeah. Graydon, and seeks comfort there. Right. Uh, Oh, there's just so much. Right. Well, the and, baseball and, scene, even like they do that tackle, and like mm-hmm. Grady, I believe, pantses him, and he's like wearing yeah. a jock strap, like yeah. their ass just there. It's very homoerotic. It's, it's, yeah. So yeah. There, there, yeah, there's several very homoerotic scenes, but also, um, you know, there is the there's the there's the thing of like having this thing inside you that you're afraid of, that you're afraid will come out this, the battling the monster inside you. Cause that's how kind of how it was seen in the eighties, especially during the AIDS pandemic. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, and, you know, gay, like, especially around that time being a homosexual became a, that's around when it became the, uh, the bad thing because of the AIDS pandemic, like people started to consider it, a, a problem like a bigger problem back then because of the AIDS the because of because that's when AIDS broke out um but yeah having this monster inside you that you don't want to release and you don't want the world to see like that's that's definitely a big part of it but it's not just because I think you're spot on with all that but also when you consider uh his relationship with Freddie like when they're when they're face to face and he's like correct Freddie's like caressing his yeah. his face with his and yeah, yeah and and uh, it's very, very erotic. Like it's, it's there's, there's some tension between, uh, between Jesse and, and Fred um, uh, during that scene. Um, now, and I will say this: when it comes to Freddy being a metaphor of the monster inside him, that being a metaphor for, you know, queerness, just at face value, you know, he doesn't want to let that monster out. It might be a sign of the times when this came out, but the lesson that Freddy does, he does let the monster out. And he kills a party of kids yeah. uh, or a party of teens. Not the best thing, but again, yeah. might be because this is 85 we're talking about. So, right. yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, David Chaskin, uh, the writer, uh, turns out to be just like the biggest villain in this whole thing anyway. So because horrible. we talk about, we, you know, when we talk about how it's become a gay movie, a gay icon, we, we act like it's new. People were calling it you know, in 1985, calling it the 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 first gay horror movie, like mm-hmm. it, it was that was that was still a thing. Like gay people were, were you know, queer, queer people were gravitating toward this movie since from the very beginning. Uh, so from it's the not very, very subtle. It's not very it's subtle not, either. It's, it's not, like, you know, yeah. it's not. People keep calling it subtext, but it's kind of the text, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, of the film. So anyway, David uh, David Cheskin has been asked about it from the very beginning, from 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 the start. And originally, he said. No, there's no there's no gay subtext in it. There's nothing gay in it. That's all down to our star, who was a gay person. Mm. So he threw he threw uh, uh, Mark Patton uh, just, Mark Mark Patton just under the bus, like yeah. saying this movie wow. was this this movie was ruined because of that. The subtext was always there, but it was always intended to be homophobic, not homoerotic, mm. uh, which which is I, I which is also terrible. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, and then he, uh, and then finally he's, he's because probably just because it's more accepting and that, you know, more people have embraced it now. Uh, he's now saying that it was always intended. He just didn't, he didn't want to tell anybody. Um, huh. But uh, yeah, he was, so that is basically, that is a big part of the, of the documentary. Mark Patton is struggling with that because it kind of drove him out of, away from Hollywood. Like he was a, he was a Broadway actor. Then he got some roles on TV and then he got this big breakout role. Um, And as a closeted gay person um, who suddenly realized he's in a gay 
movie in the mid eighties. Yeah. There's uh, your career basically. There, yeah. And so, and then, and then when the writer is like, no, this wasn't gay. It was all because of how gay Mark was like in the eighties. Like mm. that's, that's basically your career. Yeah. Cause then people who are homophobic can then attack the actor for that it, because they don't want gayness in their, you know, precious movie series. And we see that even a little bit today too, with just some modern blockbusters and especially internationally, the way movies are released, you know, some people mm-hmm. just like, you know, just don't want any of that in their movie, but it's like, it's such a substantial part of culture. Like it, it's, it is life, you know? And, and I just think, you know, the more we show that on screen without, you know, any sort of hesitation and the more we can acknowledge it overtly also is a big thing too. Cause while this film never says it overtly, it is overt enough in its imagery and its writing to at least suggest it very heavily. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I actually do uh, appreciate the film for that, for being bold like that. And it, and it sucks that the actor didn't go off to be a bigger star because like Chris said earlier, he's really good in this. He's actually really good. He, he brings yeah. that level of fear uh, into this. And he is like you said, Chris playing such an unconventional type of protagonist he's not like the hunk the hunk who's trying to battle the the monsters the braving dashing leading man no he's a very unconventional type of leading man but i think that makes it even more intriguing um because it also shows that like men can also be emotional you know they don't have to always put on that tough exterior which i also like you know this is more groundbreaking than i think you know the people acknowledge it for but i think it's because of what you said matt with the, the writer that it has not been as big of a movie outside of you know, a very niche community because I, right. I feel like a lot of people outside of the film and gay community don't always talk about this film as much. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. Just like the general public, which is a shame because I think they should. And just touching back on, you know, David Chaskin's writing, uh, Mark Patton, he's gone on record mentioning that some of the iconic moments in the film he didn't want to do. Like, for example, the unpacking scene where he breaks into that little dance. <laughs> He dreaded doing that scene um, until finally, like, you know, he was forced to do it. And it was in the script, like, down to mm-hmm. him bumping his butt up against the drawer three times. Like, that was all in the script. So right. the writing was just there to be. Right. Well, and, yeah, Mark Patton says, has said many times, he's like, I didn't do anything that was not written in the script. Like, it right. was. Right. And, you know, David Cheskin, who is who's here's the thing even at the end of that documentary they they make up like yeah, they try to hash it out but they try to I still walk away like he's a villain <laughs> like just... mark seems to get walk away like i'm satisfied and i'm like his sorry was i'm sorry uh if unintentionally i uh did anything to hurt you it's like that's a sorry not sorry like that's a sorry yeah that's very sorry for how you you feel that way yeah Yeah. i'm sorry you feel that way it's very bad um and even like the director who seemed like a cool dude toward the end of that documentary he's he's like he's talking to mark and he's like he's like uh he's like listen you've been talking about this a little too much maybe you need to back off like it was definitely a let it go like it was a let it go but it just like it was like you're just so much on 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 david like it's like okay just leave him like you haven't dealt with had to deal with this like you made a movie and then we went on to make more movies like (laughs) chill regardless of of the intention um it has become what it is and i think that that is a i think it's a good thing you know in the in the in the documentary they do show uh people reviews who are like oh my god this movie is so gay one half star you know uh, or yeah. like i can't believe that uh, but then like you have the other side and that's why it's good yeah you're always going to have those people you're going to have the incels and the people who who are who are going to use the f slur and who are gonna who are going to never come around or at least not anytime soon come around mm-hmm. uh to rational thinking uh but you have the other side, which is the group of people who grew up where this was largely the only representation they had in movies, yeah. or at least in, in big movies. Like, you know, the, there's some here and there, but if you didn't want to watch a French movie or something, like, this was pretty much, like, it for a lot of people. Right. And and especially in that genre. Um, and, and not in no matter what David Chaskin says he was trying to do, it's not... It's not. Uh, I mean, it it's literally demonizing it, but it's not. It's not um, a 
sleepaway camp where oh, yeah. Uh, yeah like it's not it's not doing that where the reason they are like this is because of the thing like it that's mm. that's not it, it is a metaphor for the for for his queerness and not it, it's not uh it's not demonizing it per se although right literally it <laughs> Pretty, is demon. Yeah. It, literally it is making him deep yeah. <laughs> um, like i said i think as far as the film goes uh even you know the subtext being there even looking beyond that it's just a good time the movie is yeah. just a good time like it's just fun how was this received uh it was released on november 1st 1985 the day after halloween what's up with that yeah that's not a great time oh. that's weird <laughs> <laughs> uh, it grossed thirty million dollars on a three million dollar budget, so obviously a success uh, by any standard. Um, uh, critical views were missed, were mixed. Some some critics actually gave it really high marks for being clever and relatable. Uh, some a lot of them gave it low marks for being a mess. Um, <laughs> how is it viewed now? Uh, it's and we've already talked about this. We it's regarded as many as the worst in the franchise, which I highly disagree with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's developed a cult following as a great queer horror movie, which we also talked about. Um, okay, which brings us to our honorifics. Um, <laughs> so first, uh, and here's the thing: my train wreck moment, worst actor, and worst line of dialogue are just the same. It's all okay. one thing. Go uh, for it, Matt. So I'm going to go and do all three of those at the same time. Uh, the, the the train wreck moment for me uh, is the push up scene where they're doing push ups and here's why <laughs> number one they're doing very very bad push ups uh, the other reasons the, the the more of the reasons is that the worst actor in this movie in my opinion is Robert Russler who plays Ron Grady mm. uh, and he has uh, he has and and I said the dialogue was better uh, in this movie however. Ron Grady does have some bad dialogue, and that's part of why – that's probably why I feel like he's the worst actor in right. the movie also is because his dialogue is mostly bad, which uh, I'm going to read a little snippet of the dialogue here. Um, so Ron Grady, while they're doing push-ups, says, so what about you and that rich babe you've been cruising to school with every day? Jesse Walsh says, what about her? And Ron Grady says, are you mounting her nightly or what? <laughs> Um, very, very not, not very subtle, <laughs> not, very, not subtle. Um, very, very bad writing. I was, uh, yeah, it's so that's my that's my bad, that's my worst line of dialogue, my worst actor, and my train wreck moment. Um, wow. I'll go mine because my mine is similar in terms of my line of dialogue. It's another Ron Jesse exchange. Uh, it's very brief. It's when they're jogging. It's hey Grady, do you remember your dreams? Only the wet ones. Um, oh God! I, yes. I just think that that is such a cringy line, um, because even even in an ironic or unironic sense, it, it is just a bad line of dialogue. I don't know why it needs to be said. Um, I don't really have a worst actor because, like guys, like you've both kind of mentioned, like I think everyone's doing well in this movie. Oh, yeah, I think everyone kind of understands well. the assignment. Um, actor who elevated the material for me though is Mark Patton. Probably no surprise because I think he is just doing a really great job. And of course, Robert Englund, always great. Uh, my favorite of the three horror, big horror three villains, uh, Freddy, Jason, Michael. Like he's my favorite. So, um, yeah, I, I think honestly, everyone elevates this. I, I don't think there's one person for me that detracts from the overall. They uh, all understand the assignment. Here's the thing um, as far as actor who elevates the, the material, um, I thought I was going to be alone on this. So I was going to go last and be like, everybody's going to talk about Robert England. Yes, he's he is. But I wanted to give a special shout out to Mark Patton, uh, who's who's acting. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't today's standards. It was 1980 right. standards. So it wasn't mm-hmm. fantastic. But but it works uh, so well for this. You know, it works it, so well it, for this. It, and he puts everything he has into this movie. And you really feel what the character's going through. He really he really evokes emotion in this movie. So mm-hmm. I... I was going to say Rock, Mark Patton as well, but I thought I was going to be alone. So, uh, so I'm glad we're in agreement there. Yeah, I also had him on my list as far there as actor who elevated Mark Patton because again, he's there. The acting, kind of like what you were saying, by today's standards, sure, it is very dated, but he's showing that emotion. He's giving those screams like yeah. that's really good. Um, but going along with uh, Ron Grady that character uh one of my lines that i wrote that kind of stuck out it's they're in school they're like in the lunchroom and lisa's talking about her party 
and her friend asks Ron if he's going to be able to make it to Lisa's party. And he's like just shoveling food in his mouth, talking while chewing. So it may have been hard to get this line, but he says he can't. He's grounded. She goes, well, what'd you do? Quote, and I had my closed captioning on was I'm grounded. I threw my grandmother down a flight of stairs. <laughs> now, yes. Yikes. I guess that could have been a joke that he was telling, or did that actually happen? <laughs> like, um, yeah, it, it, I don't know about that either. And and as I mentioned, uh, Grady's dialogue is just the worst in this movie. I don't know what was going on. It almost it, it almost does seem like improv. Like it, that it line. did. Yeah. But if you watch that documentary. Dave, that sounds like something David Chaskin would write because his because when he talks, he kind of talks with weird, awkward jokes like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. It, it kind of it feels like improv, but then it also kind of it kind of feels like maybe maybe Rod Ron Grady was uh, was was David Chaskin's avatar in this movie, uh, and so that's why he legit did. sociopath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that line just really stuck out. Uh, but uh, as far as another actor, actor who I put down as elevating the material, um, honestly, I put in Marshall Bell, who played Coach Schneider. Hmm. He's not there for very long, but he felt like a character. He felt I like agree. a character I, in this world. When I wrote down that, it, that he looked and acted like Billy Eichner, because he even makes a Billy Eichner face uh, in that scene, I did... Um, I expected that to be a running thing where I could like make fun of it throughout, so I was gonna keep notes on that. But then almost immediately, he he's like good, and I'm yeah. like, oh okay, yeah. uh, this is fine. And you know, he's that first big death in in the, yeah. in the movie, and and a pretty wild one. Like you don't, really, don't so get, it's... we get very few like great death scenes or like memorable like death scenes because we get the coach, we get Grady. Um, but then we just get the party goers pretty much, right? right. Like, um, and they're like nameless, basically. Like, it's just like a free for all. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's just kind I, of weird in that way. I've got to say, though, my favorite, I, I didn't have a train wreck moment because I really don't think there's a sequence that I don't like in this, but my frame, like my favorite moment, um, it's not a death, but it, it's that, it's that, uh, ch- uh, chest bursting scene like i, I just love oh, that yeah. it's it's the practical effects but also just how gruesome and gross it is and just the tensity of uh, the intenseness of the the scene in general mm-hmm. and just the emotions and the heightening i, I just love that scene it's it's the claw i was, going I was the shocked hand. <laughs> and the director was nervous when he got this job because he he was saying like there's so many effects and I have no idea how to do any of this. Uh, uh, so luckily, but that's kind of the thing. You're yeah. you're you're surrounded by people who do know how to do that kind of thing, or at least right. who can figure it out, which is great. But yeah, a lot of those effects are really cool and really good. And yeah. yeah, the uh, I have a fingernail thing. Um, I, so that's uh, why. So so seeing out. those fingers, the, those uh, things come out. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, now I will say. A, oh, go ahead. No, I was just say, do you have a train wreck moment? Oh, uh, honestly, my train wreck moment, I will say this just because it had so many questions I have about it. Uh, the classroom scene with the snake mm-hmm. where he, I guess, has fallen asleep in class, which, again, I thought it would lead to, initially, when I first watched this so long ago, you would think that that would be a dream sequence. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, <laughs> but no, the snake is crawling on him. He wakes up, screams, and the teacher is just like, oh, what are you doing? And, like, grabs the snakes. And, <laughs> and then it's back. a real snake. Yeah. And it's a real snake. And I'm like, okay, wait. So the teacher saw the snake on him during class and saw that he was asleep, but he just thought, I'm going to see where this goes. I and he <laughs> screams, and then he goes over, chastises him, puts the snake back into the, you know, the pen. And then, uh, like, Jesse looks over at his friend Grady and, like, it's like, oh, why'd you prank me or whatever? It seemed like he was blaming him for pranking him. And I'm like, wait, so many questions. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because I agree. That's a wild scene because he, um, he, you expect that to be a dream and then it's not a dream. And then you realize why didn't anybody react like that was like, because you expect it's going to be a dream. He's going to scream. Everybody's going to laugh. The teacher's going to be like, and there's what nothing are you doing? There. Yeah. Yeah. You, what are you going to do? Which they did all of that. They did. They, they cut, they, they, they went with that, uh, with that sequence to the note 
except for the part where the snake was real, and then it makes none of it make any sense. <laughs> a simple change of the, the fact that the snake is real undermines that entire scene. Yes. Because <laughs> no one's acting like an actual person. Uh, but that's my train wreck moment. I will admit that worst actor to me, I feel bad for saying it, but was Kim Meyer, who played Lisa, mm. like the love interest. I just felt, I don't know, like... I go back and forth on her. It was just kind of awkward acting and just... I go back uh, and forth on her because there were points where she does a very 80s acting thing, like 80s TV acting situation. Um, but then that third act where she I was going to say, yeah. When she makes it to the factory, I'm like, okay... Well, yeah, that that third yeah. act is is she's really good in that yeah. in that third act. Uh, but the, yeah, the rest of it is is a little questionable. I agree. Um, okay, well that gives it brings us to the scoring, um, which uh, on my letterbox I gave this a three out of five, uh, and this does not include the bad movie bump I give to movies that are that we usually cover on here because I give a half star bump to any movie that's that's uh, that that's entertaining because it's bad. That is not included in that three. I think it's a three out of five movie uh, on its own um, because I legitimately like this movie. Uh, my frame rate score is actually going to be one, two, Freddy's coming for you out of five, six, grab a crucifix. <laughs> um, my my rating, uh, yeah, I, I think positively, just like my normal rating would be a lot higher, but, but just for the sake of this, uh, I will give it two demon baby dogs out of five. Nice. Chris? Um, I'm going to go ahead and give it three Fu Manchu fingers. Oh, okay. Yes. There you go. <laughs> nice, nice, there nice. There you go. I don't think we even need to really discuss Mount Trashmore. We can tell people about it. Uh, yeah, Mount Trashmore, yeah, we basically have a Mount Rushmore for bad movies. This is not going to be on it because I don't think this is one of the four worst movies we've covered on the show. It is uh, Birdemic, The Room, the Star Wars Holiday Special, and Batman Please. and Robin are currently our four movies on Mount Trashmore. Um, yes. but, uh, I don't think this is going to go on there. I mean, Chris and Matt, you can weigh in. Do you think this belongs in the Mount Rushmore of bad, so bad they're good it, movies? It, it does. I, it does. Not. I don't believe so. Um, cool. crazy stuff yeah. happens in this movie. I mean, we yeah. didn't touch yeah. on the bird exploding. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, true. Yeah. So, so good. It's so good. It's, it's so crazy. It's good. Not so bad. It's good. So yeah, uh, I, yes, exactly. it will not make that. It will not make that Mount Rushmore or Mount Trashmore. So that'll have to wait for another day. Another uh, third week, third month in a row where we're not getting anything on the mountain, but that's okay. Uh, because I, I think the four on there are pretty solid for now. Um, uh, before we, you know, give some final words, Matt, we do have to plug next month's movie. Um, and I don't even know what it is because Matt, you told me you'd surprise us on air. So, so tell us what what are we going to do for the month of July, Matt? Um, I think we're actually going to. Here's, here's the thing: we've had a string of movies that were bad but not entertaining, or entertainingly bad but also like good. Um, mm -hmm. So, I feel like we need to go a little bit back to the roots of this show for for at least a month, and we're going to do my personal favorite uh bad movie which is troll 2 Ooh. oh boy oh get get ready for that get get oh, your dinners cool. out and get ready to pee on them we're doing troll <laughs> 2 um i cannot wait for that um i've actually seen troll 2 so this will be a fun way to revisit uh, um, i love this movie yeah, so much yeah we'll, we'll we'll get there when we get there yeah. um but but yeah thank you guys so much i mean chris thank you so much for just lending all your brilliant experience with horror and, and queer cinema and just like bringing all your knowledge to the table because it was so insightful to just hear you both talk about just everything about this movie because you guys both love it so much um chris is there anywhere they can find you on social media or do you have any last words any anything else you want to add Oh yeah, I can be found pretty much anywhere, Twitter, Instagram, um, at Cellar Door Floor, C E L L A R D O O R F L O O R. Um, and my final thoughts are if you haven't checked out this movie, check it out. It's like I said, fun time. You lose nothing. It's yep. just a good experience. <laughs> Love it. Um, and Matt, any anything from you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd, uh, Matman XIII. 
Yep, and there it is right there. Um, and you can find me at Dylan underscore Redazzo, Twitter and Letterbox, and Dylan Pickle Movie Network here. Subscribe if you like this video. Um, yeah, get get these guys some some views because it was a really fun, insightful discussion today. And if you are a fan of Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, let us know if there are any other movies from any other horror movies you want to see. Uh, I'm sure we'd both love to have Chris back to talk about some other so bad they're good horror movies. Maybe some that are actually really bad um, for some okay. fun discussions. Chris, do you have any other favorites uh, off the top of your head uh, that are uh, maybe fitting in the so good it's bad canon? Oh my gosh. Uh, probably. Oh my God. It's right in my head. The movie with Carla Gugino where there's a mermaid there. Oh my God. Ah, oh, I wish I could remember it. It's really crazy. Like mermaid mm. Wait, when who, you who figure that out. Yeah. Let me. Okay. I need to just Carla Gugino, right now. you said? Yeah. Um, I know that, I know that, uh, Chris and I share, a uh, a, a bad movie favorite, but the problem with it she is... Creature. I'm sorry. She it's called She Creature. Okay. Came she out in 2001. Creature. It's I got Carla Gugino in it. I and check that out. Maybe we'll check that out on the show, Matt. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll, have we'll have to have, to, have Chris yeah, back. We'll, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know Chris and I have a have a joint favorite. Uh, have one that we both really love. That's a bad movie. It's called The Drum Beats Twice. Uh, oh however, God. however, so hard to find. It's so hard to find. It's not streaming anywhere. You can't wow. really buy it anymore. Uh, there was yeah. a copy. Netflix DVD service had a copy which we watched, and someone kept and it. Now I have that copy. <laughs> yes, he oh, does. Okay. Ooh, <laughs> one and only copy in the world. I, I can't get rid of it. That movie is amazing. Like, oh, sorry. maybe, no way maybe we'll have to protest to get it on a streaming service so we can also have that on, <laughs> on this show. But, um, but yeah, that, that was Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Uh, what was he, you know, what was the revenge? We don't know. We'll never know. Um, and uh, just a really great discussion. Happy Pride Month to all who are celebrating. Yes, this is, yes. this is going Pride up in the, in the middle of the month. Uh, but yeah, Pride Month, but every month, this should be about celebrating, you know, uniqueness and, and just who we are and, and embracing ourselves. So, um, thank you both again, once again, for this really fun discussion. And, uh, check us out next month for Troll 2. See y'all. What a story, Mark.